Hello everyone. Hopefully you can uh, hear me now. Uh, my name is uh, Marius Mikhailidis. Uh, I'm working as a manager of data science and an Hambi. And uh, today I would like to go through with you uh, how I managed to win multiple machine learning competitions, particularly in Kaggle, because this is where mostly I used to uh, to challenge myself and um, uh, uh, to give you a little bit of context I go I'll go through the presentation but uh, I am aware that lots of you may um, ask lots of questions so what I would like to do is um, uh, finish uh, use the first 15 minutes to talk a little bit about cargo and the, the inspiration what drove me to, to achieve this and uh, then I would like to go through your, your questions because I think that way it, it, it should be better. I mean, I'm, I'm more keen to, um, to be able to answer questions that, that you might have. If we have enough time, I will also try and answer uh, as many questions as I can from the, you know, that you, you ask within the, the, the seminar platform. So, uh, a little bit about uh, Kaggle. What is Kaggle? I assume a lot of the people know, but just for those who might not know, Kaggle is the world's biggest predictive modeling competition platform. Um, you know, this is, uh, I think at the point uh, last year, it had more than half a million members. After a while, they changed a little bit the system about uh, what, I mean, what is considered a member, but at least back then that was the case. What happens is you have a lot of big companies like Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, you know, they have lots of data and they would like to solve different machine learning problems through their data. Um, for example, uh, Facebook will try to identify what uh, um, uh, what category a specific comment may belong to. So, is it about sports? Is it about um, uh, is it about music? So they can use different targeting strategies. Uh, Microsoft will try to identify which virus may have affected uh, a specific file. Then, how we might try to uh, would like to know when a customer will shop. So, you know, there, there are different challenges and um, what happens is the, the, the winners get awarded prizes and points. So it has a, a ranking system. And after collecting uh, lots of good places, you can earn enough points in order to move up this rank. Um, so I managed to get uh, at some point number one last year after participating in many, many challenges. Um, a bit more context about the, the inspiration. So uh, I am from Greece. So uh, after I finished my undergraduate studies, uh, I moved to UK. Specifically, I went to the University of Southampton, uh, studying risk management. And um, I was uh, trying to find what to do after I finished my course. So I joined this entrepreneurship type of talks where people try to give you ideas about what you can do based on what you've learned. And I remember very vividly there was uh, a guy who came to talk to us who finished the same masters with us. Uh, and after he finished his course, he, uh, he started going to the horse races, but he wasn't really uh, like betting, he was mostly collecting data, like uh, w uh, you know who was winning, uh, what were the weather conditions, where do people bet the most, and he was collecting this data on a daily basis. And uh, at some point, he was able to make a predictive model that uh, could find the winner with more than 50% accuracy, and then he started making money out of it. I think the way he described this problem was like. Uh, extremely appealing to me, like how through the data he was able to predict the future, and uh, I, I was I was like really impressed with it. So I thought it seemed like a superpower. So this is what really 
you know, drove me into it. Um, so I remember when I finished back then, uh, I started picking up predictive modeling skills. So back then, people were using a lot SAS or SPSS on, or R, so I started learning these tools. But I quickly realized that you, you need to dive a little bit more into packages that have inside lots of algorithms. You, you need the flexibility to be able to, to either create your own stuff or be able to apply these algorithms much better. So I started uh, learning more about programming. I should mention that by this point, which was around six years ago, I had zero programming experience. So my background was economics, and then um, it was more uh, really, I mean, I did some statistical modeling, but like uh, very simple. Um, so then I became really passionate about it. I started learning Java initially. The reason I started with Java is because initially I started with C, but I thought it was too difficult. So then I started with Java. And then I started with, with Python because everybody was getting like more um, exciting with Python. It was easier to use. Uh, so I started developing algorithms. At some point, and as I was learning, decided I wanted to make public some of my work. So I released um, a tool made in, in Java, which I called it Casanova, which was mainly for credit scoring, so for predictive modeling specifically suited for, for credit tasks and, you know, like something like predicting default risks. I named it uh, after ANOVA, which stands for Analysis of Variance. It's a statistical term correlated with regression. And uh, from my mother's last name, which is Kazani. So put it together, makes Kazanova. Um, this is the same nickname I participate in Kaggle. Uh, my sister made the logo. It is, as you can see, the nose is quite uh, big because it needs to show that you have to be nosy with the data in order to, you know, to be able to, to extract the most out of it. So it was about four years ago where I've heard about Kaggle, and after having this experience with me developing uh, uh, um, a predictive modeling software, albeit simple, uh, I, I thought this is a great platform to test my skills, and I joined a few contests. However, I didn't do very well. So. People need to know that you know it takes a certain amount of time in order you know to get better into this, and people should not get intimidated. I didn't, uh, although you know I thought I I didn't go there having zero knowledge about the field. Obviously, I had some knowledge. Nevertheless, I I have to say that it it was quite difficult, you know, because some people had already developed processes and, and, and pipelines where they could do well in this kind of contests. And um, I had a lot of ground to cover and a lot of stuff to learn, but hopefully it wasn't too difficult uh, because the community was great and they were sharing a lot of material, a lot of things. I mean, if you've ever tried Kaggle, you should know that people are very open on, on the forums and you can collaborate and learn from other people too. So. Quickly, I started covering lots of ground. Uh, I did many interesting tasks in Kaggle, which I had zero knowledge before. Uh, like, I never imagined I would do these things, actually, given my background in economics. Start trying to identify the best uh, answer in a, in a Wikipedia. Uh, it, you know, it's more like, you have a, 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 a science test and you have to use the Wikipedia or anyway, Wikipedia was a good source in order to try to identify the best answer. Uh, you had to, I think that was one that Microsoft had, you had to predict which virus has infected a certain file. Again, you had to use the actual bytes as, as input variables in your model. One that happens every year, and I really like it because I'm a basket lover, um, you had to um, predict who is going to win the NCAA tournament. And it's really nice because you get 
the data before the tournament starts. You make the predictions, then you can see them happening. So that's 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 really nice. Uh, predict the Higgs bosons based on data that come from a large hadron collider. Uh, again, I had zero experience of physics, but it didn't matter. You can actually do quite well by you know by by, by trying to interrogate the data. Uh, another very interesting one was having different um, series of known relationships. For example, imagine something like um, uh, temperature and ice cream cells, um, trying to predict which one is causing the other. I think that was a really interesting task, you know, and it can be really useful because you know. Uh, breaking this down, you can actually find, you know, which one may be the one causing the other. And as you know, correlation does not imply causation, so you have to come up with different ideas, you know, in, in identifying what it's this that, you know, makes one variable causing the other. So to cut the long story short, uh, after 90 competitions, I have participated in uh, actually, more than 90 competitions. I have team up, uh, I think, ha about half of the times. Uh, I had 22 top 10 finishes. I have been prize winner a couple of times. I have not only competed on Kaggle, I have competed on other platforms too, like Kaggle Analytics. At some point, I managed to get first uh, in Kaggle out of about half a million members back then, uh, which was you know, uh, I'm, I'm really proud of this achievement that obviously is a product of many things. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm still, um, uh, I'm working on recommender systems for my uh, PhD at UCL and I'm doing, uh, again, Kaggle because I want to be up to date, I want to sharpen my skills, you know, I really enjoy playing. Um, and obviously I'm also working in the field. Um, so, as a very rough summary about what wins competitions, I think what's really important is to be able to understand the problem. I think this, this may mean many things. I mean, uh, I remember a, a, an insurance competition where you were trying to predict um, which type of insurance a person will, will choose, but you could see that in, in the grand majority of the situations, people were actually renewing. So it wasn't really, what was actually more valuable was to know if the person would renew or not. It was breaking down the problem into a much simpler one, because then you could focus on the cases that they won't renew. And this make it, made it so much easier. I, I, I'm talking about this kind of, of, of problems, you know, like, like to understand what you try to predict I mean, what is the metric you try to optimize, and then to be able to um, to make it easier for you to optimize this problem. I think you need discipline, and when I say discipline, I mostly refer to how you cross-validate, how you examine the data. You know, you, you need to be cautious about terms like overfitting or underfitting, and in order to have models that can generalize very well, on, on unobserved data, in like test data, um, you need to have a process where it is very strict, where everything you try goes into this process in order to be able to make fair assessment of whether you should, for example, try an algorithm or not. You need to have a test framework that actually tells you whether um, it, it is good to include, let's say, an algorithm or not. You need to try problem-specific things. Uh, for example, there, there are specific machine learning tasks like image classification where, you know, unless you try something called deep learning and convolutional neural networks, you are never going to do uh, very well. Uh, so for, for particular problems, you might need to invest in certain, certain approaches. Uh, but there's lots of material out there. Imagine that, you know, I didn't know these things. I learned these things as I was trying them. And uh, hopefully it won't take too long for someone to become familiar with um, all these uh, tricks and methods.
Obviously, we always report in. Uh, I remember in certain situation I was um, working an extra forty hours per week in 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 on top of whatever else I was doing. But you know, I, th I think there is a factor of, of, of skill and talent. It may be that I wasn't as talented as others, for example. Uh, I know other people don't put as much time. This is how much time I put because I really loved it. And, um, and you know, I really wanted to learn apart from the, the competition element. So for me, it was like playing a video game. So I didn't really mind. Uh, but you know, in order to do well, you have to invest time. And and when I say time, not just your personal time, computing time, hardware time. Um, yeah, uh, I think you need to have access to the right tools. And then I think I think this this goes back to to trying problem specific tools. I mean, unless you have access, for example, to some of the latest tools like Exit Boost or or, or, or Psychic Learns Random Forest, you won't be able to do just you know like. Too, too well. You need you need to have access and, and be up to date with whatever comes out. Um, I think collaboration is extremely important uh, in in data challenges. You can see that in many different ways. Um, I think apart from the fact that a person might see the problem completely differently, so you know, like combining two different approaches. Can cover uh, can uncover more unexplained information. It's also a good way to divide tasks. You know, to say uh, I will focus on feature engineering because I'm better in this area. You can focus in model tuning, and maybe the other guy can focus more in assembling or and and and, and combining models. So it's um, you, you can cover more ground this way. So I think I think I think it helps. And generally, you, you know, you. you Different people are better in different things. So this kind of um, uh, organizing the tasks can really help you, uh, you know, get to the next level. And obviously, assembling this this implying uh, combining lots of different models, trying to uncover as much information as you can for what you try to predict, and um, and, and and yeah, I mean, and you know, go beyond one model approaches. You know, um, basically, uh, the rest of the of the presentation covers uh, more technical elements about uh, what I did to 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 get better in Kaggle and win competitions. But I think a lot of these things were covered from the questions people were making. So I would rather to go through the set of questions I received from you guys and uh, or girls and. Um, Hopefully we, we, we can we can cover a lot of ground. So it just switch back of the spelling mistakes because um, now I did that really quickly. I received this like two hours before the presentation. Uh, but I think I think I think it's nice to cover this this question and more your your questions. So the first question was, what are the steps you follow for solving a machine learning problem? Please, please describe from scratch. When I say, just just to highlight, when we say a ML problem, I assume uh, you mean a, a machine learning challenge like, like in Cargo. So what I do in this situation is, in, so I see what type of data I have, I have to data, I have numerical data, I use, I, I plot distributions, I try to understand um, a little bit about what its field may be. This may not always be possible, but you know, this is what I try to do. I try to get familiar with the data set. I try to not be intimidated by the data, if that, if that makes sense. And then I try to see what I really try to optimize. I mean, what, what this challenge is asking me to do. Is me, it, it, is it asking me to um, to uh, right? So um, what uh, what I then try to do is to, um, uh, for example, there are certain problems when you try to optimize for classification accuracy. 
you try to see how well you can predict uh, a certain outcome. Uh, you need to understand what you try to optimize because there are, for example, different algorithms or different strategies that are, are better for, for its task. Then you need to decide on a cross-validation strategy. You want to say this is, how am I going to test how well I'm doing before I actually try to do final predictions? And that, that's really important because if you are able to create a reliable uh, testing framework, because this is what cross-validation is, you can try lots of things and you can see the impact they yield before you actually go to making some test predictions. Uh, I think that's really important because normally we use something like called cross-validation. So we, um, or, or uh, um, for example, for, for multiple times we have some training data, we divide them into train and validation, so we keep some percentage for training, some percentage for validation, we try different things on the training data, we apply them on validation and we see what is the performance, normally on the, on the metric we try to, to optimize. And um, uh, so being able to rely on this process is, is, is quite critical. You need to be careful because in some situations, you cannot always randomly split your data. For example, sometimes you may need to predict the future, and you might have data which are very sensitive to that, so it's better to have your training data being in the past, and your, the, your validation data being in the future. So within this cross-validation framework, I do hyperparameter tuning. When I say hyperparameter tuning, I try lots of different things and I try to see what, what, what performance they yield into my metric. For example, I do data transformation, like scale my data, making certain they don't have very big values, or try to remove outliers, I try to treat null values, I try to transform categorical variables, there are many ways to do this. I try to see which features are, are important or which features interactions are important, like combining feature A with feature B. Um, again, this, this happens within my cross-validation. So I do one change normally. I see what average performance I have. If it is better than before, then I maintain it and I do a next change. So it is like a loop process, like, you know, you keep changing parameters and you try to see what performance you, you, you get. Uh, in the same process, you are choosing algorithms and you are tuning the hyperparameters. Each model has different parameters. For example, in a random forest, you might need to, to find what's the optimal maximum depth or um, how many features you need to consider for its split. In neural networks, you need to consider how many hidden layers you need to put or how much regularization or dropout you need to add. All these things are controlled within this cross-validation process. And obviously, you save the results of this process. Uh, so you save the predictions, and you can then use them for something that we call meta-modeling or assembling. So all these predictions now become features for new uh, models. So you can use the predictions of your first models to make, uh, to become features in a new model. So instead of combining, you know, raw data, you now try to combine models. And again, you follow exactly the same process. So the same data, which are now predictions of your model, you know, go through the same process again. You may need to transform them, transform them, you may need to find new algorithms that, that do best with this kind of input data, and so on. So I'm... I'm, I'm of course, I'm moving forward. I feel hopeless while working on any competition. Um, I think, uh, obviously, you need Start with learning some programming. I assume this is this is something that everybody uh, has done to some extent, like some very basic elements, like loops and and um, you know like how, how to assign values, how to create functions. Normally, you can start with Python, and then you need to start learning some tools, like you know like some some algorithms, 
become familiar with some of the terms like cross validations, start understanding some of the metrics. Then you need to follow some online courses, which I'll give you some material later on, and some, for example, online books. This can really help. But I think what's mostly better is to participate in knowledge competitions. So in Cargo, there are some competitions flagged as for knowledge, and these ones are like real competitions, but you don't really compete for a prize. So it's really nice. I mean, you, you don't need to be stressed about not doing very well. And, um, and, and you can try lots of things that have exactly the same format as real competitions. So I think it's, um, it, it's a really good way to start. You can see, you can share code and you can see what the other people are doing. Um, another thing that I really like is to go into even finished or live competitions and see the kernel section. Just to let you know, kernels is a way in Cargo to, to create scripts that run on, on Cargo servers and uh, to share code. So even if you don't have sort of a, a, a computer yourself, let's say you don't have good processing power, you can use Cargo's processing power uh, through this kernels functionality. So you can add scripts on the servers. Uh, or you can look for past competitions. So if you go back to some competitions that have already finished, you can still download the data and you can see what people did to win competitions. Sometimes they, they, they share their code, so you can learn from it. I have also um, done that. So in, for example, for the Microsoft Classification Challenge, I think you can find my, uh, my winning solution. Generally, there is no easy way to make your, your hands your hands dirty. You need to participate. You, you need to play. I mean, I know it might be intimidating, intimidating sometimes, but, uh, you know, we, we all started from, you know, from, from really low. You know, it, it, it takes a while to, to, to improve, and uh, but it will happen. You know, you keep playing, it, it will happen. For some people, it takes longer. For some people, it, it, it happens, like, faster. You don't need to, to stress yourself, you know, like, you, you play for fun. Um, and, you know, and, and, and enjoy the process and the learning in general. Uh, something that has helped me a lot, uh, every time, in every competition I participate, I save the code, I save the functions which I found useful. Um, you know, I, 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 I save parameters of tools I have used, so in every time I find myself I don't need to do that much anymore, you know, I just try to find a code that has helped me in the past and try to either make changes or either try to improve it so recursively you, you, you can become better over time. You know, it, it won't happen right away because, you know, it's actually creating this kind of code bank is important. I'm pretty sure everyone has this that, that you know, plays consistently on Kaggle. But, you know, over time you will develop the, you know, the kind of functions which, which are good and can help you do well. Uh, I think people to start the learning, a newbie who knows Python. I don't want to spend too much time on this one. I have provided material here. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious about the fact that uh, every time I scroll from, from, the, from the Word document, uh, my voice uh, breaks, so what I'll try to do is try maybe to open another laptop and maybe try to uh, to see from from there. Um, uh, but while I do this, let me tell you that um, in general, uh, I really like for 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 a starting point, University of Utah has some really good slides about machine learning that explains some of the of the algorithms. Um, so I have a link you you can check it later. I'm providing some links for some free online uh, ebooks. Uh, I like a lot the Scikit-Learn documentation. I heavily uh, recommend this. Um, you should, I mean, people that want to start with Python, they should get uh, Anaconda. The reason I'm saying this is because it has a lot of libraries for, 
for and packages for what you would really need in terms of uh, of machine learning type of uh, tasks. Um, you can also uh, I, back in the day I had uh, uh, I made a blog uh, in Kaggle where I was listing tricks and tools I used um, in order to become first in Kaggle and I think I have uh, lots of material there. Um, I'm a little bit cautious because I need to scroll down but I know uh, it might break, uh, it might break my voice. Um, Right, <laughs> I'm also receiving instructions. Um, you know, I'm receiving feedback. Apologies for for this. Uh, so I think other good links is Andrew's NG's uh, Coursera course. I think that's really good. It has helped lots of people. You can get, you can understand some basic elements of uh, of machine learning there. So I recommend. Uh, I list some blogs which I really like, like ML Wave or FastML. They tend to have lots of information about tool and machine learning models. I really like Analytics Vitia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this uh, all right. <laughs> Probably not. But certainly it's, it's, a, it's, it's a website about analytics that has lots of materials about algorithms, tools, processes. Has too. So I, I, I recommend it. You can learn a lot of things from there. But as I said, no extremely easy solutions. I mean, uh, you need to get your hands dirty. That's that's the best way to learn. You know, like you know, fall into the mud. It's it's it's, it's just you know. I think I think you need to have the right mentality. You know, not not get intimidated. You know, it takes some time, but you 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 you'll get there. Um, I, I've been asked which techniques form better with large uh, data sets. I think um, uh, generally for large memory issues, what um, what has really helped me is like tools like Valpar Rabbit, Follow the Regularized Leader, LibFM for factorization machines, FieldAware factorization machines. I like the Loop Linear tool. Generally, when you work with very sparse data, very large data, you need to consider sparse matrices in Python. Uh, th this is a good, a good way to handle very, very big data really fast. And uh, another thing that helps me is when I try to run many models on subsets of this data. Sometimes you don't need the whole data. Actually, working on, on small subsets can be equally good. become a machine learning expert. I think some of the things I have already mentioned cut this. What are the model selection and data manipulation techniques you follow to solve a problem? Generally, I try almost everything for most problems, but I think for different problems, there are you know different techniques which are like more suited. For example, for time series, you should try ARIMA models, GATS models, models like regression, but that rely a lot on 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 like on like past data, like on moving averages. Um, another thing that, uh, for example, for image classification, you should try deep learning or sound. Again, neural networks work quite well. When you have very big data with categorical features, very high cardinality, linear model, VAPA, VAPIT, consider transforming your data back to dense format using some singular value decomposition. For everything else, I use gradient boosting machines like XJBoost or like GBMs and deep learning. I think these are the tools that do best right now. This question also asked me uh, how I do model selection. I actually do model selection either based on the reasoning I just explained, like you know, 
I have some preference for specific models for different problems. But I also do it when assembling through cross-validation. Because as I told you, my models become features, become predictions that are entered into another model. And then I use standard model selection techniques where I would use for any other feature, like forward selection or backward selection. When I say forward, it means add one feature at a time, in this case, one model prediction at a time, and try to see if it makes an impact or not. It improves my, my cross-validation metric or not. Another thing that has worked me is doing backward or mixed. So try to add a feature, try to remove a feature, try to do both and see if there is better results. Another thing that has worked for me is uh, using permutations. So actually uh, train a model with some features and then replacing the features with some random values and try to see how much prediction gets worse. Uh, with these random values, you might be surprised that there are cases where you replace uh, uh, some variables on a model that is already trained with these variables, you replace it with random values and actually it performs better, just because this variable was completely useless. Another thing that helps me is to use something like feature importance. You know, in regression, you might be looking at like t statistics or or you know looking how, how how significant your variable is random forest has its own feature importances so you can use this to rank the features and see which ones are the most important uh, you, you can use some stats logic too so if you see some features are too correlated say i'm not going to use this one because the other one seems to be doing pretty much the same thing. This involves a little bit more subjective judgment. Hopefully, you don't need to use this too much, especially on, on, on bigger data. My data manipulation is different for every problem. For example, for time series, as I said, you can use stuff like moving averages. You need to do a lot of outlier removal. They're more sensitive. Or you can use derivatives. Uh, this is like changing your features, trying to remove noise. Uh, for text data, you can use some transformation like TFIDF, or you can count how many times each word appears. You can use something like word to vec, trying to play with sparse matrices, do hashing and, and one hot encoding. For image classifications, you need to scale images. You need to do resizing, you need to remove noise, sometimes you need to say which object appears at which location on the image, which is like annotating, so that there is different type of work you, you need to do. For sounds, you need to consider Fourier transforms or male frequency subtract coefficients that try to uh, decompose the signal, a signal into numerical features and use this for, for modeling. For, I think for everything else, I use like standard um, uh, data manipulation techniques, which I will discuss later on. People are the, all this is translated into into businesses. Like uh, they, they asked me to give an example about. Um, I mean, what, what is a typical problem you can face in, in in business? And I want to 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 take an example that. I'll take a hypothetical example. Let's say I, the first thing you need to do is to find a business question. So say, I want to recommend products online because I believe this will, it will, it will increase the, the buys, you know, how many the purchases that people make. So you have this, these questions. You want to, to, to increase the number of purchases people make. And you try to translate this into a machine learning problems. You say, for example, that I'll try to predict what the, what the customer is going to buy in the future, given some data that I think the customer will have available at the point where I would like him to make, where I will expose him with the items. And um, I can use some historical data of recommendations I've made and what the customer may have chosen in the past break this down to some features and try to see how I can link the two, so which historical recommendations have, have worked best in order to um, 
uh, 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 to make an algorithm that, that selects best these uh, these items. Once this is done, then you need to establish a, a test framework. So you know you need to have some again some training data, some validation data. Normally in the future, this this normally has to be in the future. You know in in, in a business context, you are more I think more keen on 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 having a really strong um, test framework that resembles the reality as best as possible. And then you need to find, um, once this is established, then you need to find, again, the best models and best feature engineering that predicts um, uh, what, the customer, what the customers will buy in the future. Uh, you need to consider cost and time efficiency too. Uh, obviously here, sometimes large ensembles are not preferred. Ideally, you would like a model that does quite well, but it's not very complicated. But generally, deployment becomes an issue. So how you can easily uh, deploy this without much cost. Then normally, you have this model. You export your model parameters, which may, may not be just a model. It may be feature engineering. It may be like as a scaling and different things. So you will call this a, a pipeline. So you export this. You apply this pipeline into a real environment, an online environment, and you expose customers, but not everyone. So you have a test and control. So then you can go and see over time how well is the group that has been exposed to the customer doing versus the other group. And then you need to keep monitoring this, and you can make adjustments based on the feedback that you get. It may be that the new algorithm is not performing better than the previous one. Uh, generally, roughly, this is this is this is a process, or in a real-time environment, of how you could use this to, to make predictions. People are asking about material and books, and uh, I, I, I have displayed some before. I will share for you this document so you can have access to it. Some of my favorite libraries in Python are NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn has a lot of models. Matplotlib is good for visualization. Obviously, XJBoost. XJBoost is the, the magic pot that you can throw it with dirt and gives you gold. It's an extremely good algorithm and, and package. I like Keras for machine learning and TLK for text uh, analysis. Again, NoLearn helps me with neural networks. Jensen, again, is, is very good for text data. It has world to vec and other algorithms. For images, I use Scikit normally. It has a, a specific package for images. There are many other packages. Now I just list this. So how to decide which machine learning algorithms to use for solving a particular problem? I think I have mentioned this, but also consider trusting your cross-validation. So you can always try an algorithm and see how well it does. You know, I mean, you need to trust your testing framework. If, if it doesn't do well in cross-validation, then you don't need to worry. If you have time to try everything, then that's even better. Uh, what is your favorite machine learning algorithm? It has to be gradient boosted trees. But as I said, I think uh, like for, like XJBoost or, or, or like GBM, there are packages that, that, that do this. But as I said before, there are different algorithms better for different tasks. So you, you should keep that in mind. But generally speaking, for, for a very flat file with a file with common structure, which may be sparse or non-sparse, I think gradient boosted trees can do generally quite well without that much pre-processing. So that, that, that's why I like it. So the R versus Python, personally, I prefer Python. I think it's more programmist. Uh, I think R is, 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 is very good, too. I think back in the day, it wasn't very efficient. This is now changing over time, as a lot of functions are, are being written in, in, for example, C. Uh, I think you can do either one. I personally prefer Python. I mean, R has more coverage in terms of algorithms. Python generally is more efficient. Uh, I think efficiency is a key, so that's why I focus more in, in Python.
what would uh, so if someone wanted to switch careers what else do they need apart from technical skills I think something that you need to do and it is quite to translate I made a spelling mistake forgive me for that ability to translate business problems to machine learning problems I explained this before uh, a, a company might have like lots of data but how exactly to use it to to, to derive like value it's it's subject to much more than the technical skills. Other softer skills like ability to explain results, ability to, to, to understand business requirements is also quite important. But, um, you know, I, th I think everybody has a place. I mean, it's, uh, I think just having technical skills is also good for, for certain tasks. I mean, uh, you don't need to have like everything you know like to be extremely good in presentations good at translating business problems to to to, uh, to machine learning problems or very good to, to to doing supervised learning i mean you can uh, you know you, you can always specialize it's just you know good if you have other skills too but not necessary so hadoop and spark um, i think you can scale your work better with these tools but um, I still think that you cannot make the most predictive models with these environments. I mean, they're not extremely suitable. It's mostly for leveraging very, very large uh, data. However, I think over time this will change, you know. Uh, so there will be, uh, for now, at least for me, is a way to be able to, to do some, some pre-processing and to, to get my data faster. But I would still prefer, for example, to do my, most of my machine learning work, like, for example, the algorithms in, in uh, another science environment, let's say. Because, you know, I can have more, I can use more libraries and I can do, like, um, yeah, I think I have, have, have more exposure to tools and, and techniques. But I generally think that this is the way forward. I mean, especially once Hadoop and Spark have more uh, extensive coverage of algorithms and, and techniques. Do you agree with the statement that feature engineering is um, is generally more important than improving individual models? In principle, yes. Uh, however, and I I also think that model diversity is generally better than having having a few really strong models. But generally, it depends on the problem. As I said, for for image classification, unless you have a really strong convolutional uh, network model you just you're not going to do very well so i think it depends on the problem but in principle i've seen uh, that the random forest approach where you have a lot of weak learners combined together giving you a very good result to be uh, to be uh, uh, you know to um, to be the case with most machine learning problems you know you don't need to focus on making really strong models. You need to focus on feature engineering. You need to focus on making, to try to seize the data from multiple angles. And this is where you get, uh, like, you know, better results from diversity, not necessarily from making very strong models. What skills required to get to the top on Cargo? Uh, and is there overlaps between, um, uh, I mean, can you, if you're good in cargo, does it mean that you can be a good data scientist? And uh, if you're good in cargo, in general, would you be successful? I think there is a overlap between working on cargo and in your work, especially if your work is quite technical. A lot of the skills about modeling, uh, validation, you know, sometimes you need to do a lot of visualizations. This help, help a lot in your working environment. Obviously, there's these extra elements I mentioned late, previously, like translating business questions to modeling problems, how you monitor models, how you focus on efficiency and, and deployment, which are, which are different things. Sometimes it's difficult to explain difficult concepts to stakeholders. This requires uh, softer skills, you know, be good in presentations. But in general, I think there's a good percentage of overlap and there is always room for a good cuddler. I think it's, it's someone who's really good in cuddle has demonstrated that 
it can work patiently with the data, it can understand problems and it can solve them well. So I definitely see that, you know, you, um, a good calculator can, should be able to get like a, 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 good, a good job. Uh, but it's always good to, to keep in, involved, you know, uh, improving the other software skills too. Which machine learning concepts are must to perform well in Kaggle? As I said, I think you need to be able to interrogate the data, to have ways to visualize the variables so that you can thoroughly examine them and understand them, especially in relation to some target variable. You need to be able to, to transform your data and do a lot of pre-processing, transform categorical variables, numerical variables, do interactions. Um, uh, you need obviously to know and have access to the tools, like some of the tools I mentioned before. Uh, you need to be familiar with metrics and optimizations, like you know, some, some algorithms are better for some metrics, while others do better for other tasks. Obviously, as I said, you need to become very familiar with cross-validation and how you can create a reliable best framework to, to test your models and, and, and your hypothesis. Then you need to become a little bit more familiar about the algorithms and how you tune the models. I mean, you need to be a little bit familiar about, you know, what things you need to look at its algorithm. And obviously, you need to learn how to combine a lot of different models. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm cautious about the time, so I'm moving forward. What are the strategies you would recommend beginners uh, in a competition? In general, if you're a beginner, I would say, I mean, apart from the stuff I have already covered, I would say you start with one algorithm and you follow the steps I've mentioned above. You know, like how, how you load your data, how you transform it, how you try to optimize the parameters for this algorithm, uh, because I think it's better this way and you can understand what impact each change yields to the overall outcome. But this involves, you know, like, you know, getting your heart uh, dirty. But this way you can start getting familiar with the overall process. And once one algorithm at a time, you, you, you can start, you know, keep externing your arsenal of algorithms and, and how you tune them in order to get the best result. But yeah, I mean, start slowly, one at a time. This is how I started myself. How do you see the future of data scientists? Is automation co going to kill this job? I don't think so. This is what they used to say about automation through computing, but you know, see how many developers uh, are, are needed to actually do this, this automation. I think this is not you know, likely to, to, to happen. It may be possible that the focus of data scientists change a little bit, so there is more need for these software skills I mentioned. For example, like translated business questions to machine learning problems. I keep saying this because I think it, it, it's, it's important in a business environment. Uh, but you know, generally, you need to sort of become a manager of this process, you know, to, to, to manage. I mean, you, you don't need to hard code so much. You need just, you know, to manage the tools, manage the process, you know. I think it, it will become more a tuning process in the future, but there will still be there, there still be need for people to manage this process. It will always be a a semi-complicated process. I mean, you need to have some understanding, some training over it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't see that you know jobs will be sort of lost. It's just the focus might change a little bit over time. But I think it, it is similar to programming. You know, it's just you know more programming, more computing automation means just you know more developers. How to use the modeling uh, for R in Python. I have an example for Python and I give this link to my GitHub. We are using a past Kaggle competition in order to show you how to use different symbol um, techniques. So I, I, I refer you to there because I'm cautious about the time. You should, you should have a look. learning libraries or for text analysis. Again, I like Keras because now it supports past data and I like Jensen too. For example, you can do word to vec which is essentially a neural network. 
how valuable is the knowledge get, uh, gained through these competitions in real life? Um, sometimes I see lots of assembling. Is this the case in real productive production systems? Uh, are interpretable models more valuable than those monster ensembles? I think in some cases, yes, being interpretable or fast or memory efficient is, is preferred, but I think this is likely to change over time. I think we are through a process where this was a very stats-driven field, and now it becomes more of an engineering field, if that makes sense. Where people in the past, where we didn't have much big data, people were more keen on, on relying on stats, you know, or, or making a few sound models, where now because we have so much data, we can immediately understand the impact one algorithm yields without, by having a reliable test framework without spending so much time in, in making certain that uh, you know, the model is, is, is extremely sound in terms of like, uh, um, uh, you know, st st statistically sound. So I think over time we will move to more black box solutions. People are going to say, I don't care what this algorithm has in it. I don't care how it makes its prediction. I have a testing framework that can I, I, I trust. I can see the results that you, you throw the data into this black box. I can see that the, the, the results you're giving me really help me to make better predictions. And so I think this is how it's going to move. You know, I think people will stop being afraid of black box solution. Interpretability will be less of an issue in the future. And uh, yeah, I still see that right now having interpretable models is preferred, but I think over time they're going to be, there's going to be a shift for more, uh, um, for more heavy machine learning approaches into this area. Should I worry about learning about the internals of the machine learning algorithms or just go ahead and try to form an understanding of the algorithms and use them in competitions, I think you don't need to understand the internals. I don't know the internals of all the algorithms. Uh, it is good if you do. I mean, it helps you like sometimes to, 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 to do better pre-processing or to make like better decisions about how you need to have your data in order to get the most out of them. But I think, um, you know, just because of very rapid changing things, there are tools that come out every day, um, it, sometimes it's even tough to keep pace, I think you shouldn't over-invest in an algorithm. I think you can you can invest in certain algorithms which, which you are likely to use commonly, like LG Boost, for example, like, like generally gradient boosting, or, or maybe some, some in deep learning, but um, it's just, you know, it's you don't need to fully understand, I mean, you don't need to be able to code the algorithm yourself. I mean, you, you need to have that mentality. You just need to be able to use it. You know, you, it's good if you can understand a little bit about these hyperparameters and how to tune them, see what others have done. But in principle, I think you shouldn't really overinvest. You shouldn't be good just in, in one. It's, it's, it's better to be moderate in many. This is how I say it. How did you improve your skills in machine learning? I think I did a lot of the stuff mentioned before about like material and courses and blogs, participating in Kaggle. Uh, it's just I also tried a lot of programming myself. So I, I, I have I have to admit, and because of my PhD, but I've done it before too. I, I, I've read a lot of academic papers, but just because you're asking about me, I think. I think you don't need to do everything, you know, and I think over time it becomes easier to, to get um, familiar with, with, with the topics. Uh, so, uh, you know, following a good up-to-date machine learning courses or books and with um, uh, some very good books and, you know, do a lot of cuddling because, trust me, if there's something new, these people will try it out. I'm impressed by how quickly people in Kaggle, you know, like, consume the, the new software and generally new um, new knowledge that comes out. And it's, it's really good to learn. 
which are the best machine learning techniques for imbalanced data. I think I might surprise people here. I have this discussion lots of times. I, do, I don't do something special here. I know people, uh, I, I, there are a lot of sampling techniques that deal with this problem. For me, it comes down to what is the metric you try to optimize for, for these competitions. Because if you're optimized for something that you see, you don't really care about imbalanced data. If you care really about getting good classification accuracy, um, I, I still don't, I mean, unless, um, it's, 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 it's a hard, it, it, this is a hard topic to, to explain because I, I'm, I'm quite keen to skip this one actually because uh, I'm worried about the time. Uh, maybe I will write a more detailed answer later. In principle, I don't focus so much uh, on, I'm not, I'm not doing transformation because I think, for example, let, let's imagine a classification problem. Just try having a class which is 19% versus one which is 10%. Getting it down to 50-50, it just when, when when training, let's say, it just helps you make decisions better. So if someone expects, is this a yes or a no? Um, you have sort of create and false a misconception about what is the distribution of the data. It does help you to make decisions, but I think this is something you should be able to do with a different cutoff, let's say. Uh, even when you had a 90 and 10 percent problem, I'm, 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 uh, I think there, there are different opinions here. I'm generally I don't do special treatment, and I think this leads a lot more discussion. I cannot just cover it with, with a few lines, but for me this is not really an issue I I ever had to worry about. How do you deal missing values? And I think that's the last question. I think there are different ways here, but for me this is again uh, something I tune during cross-validation. So first I might try using mean or median, right? First I try to use, if that doesn't work, I might try to select some missing, uh, some, some values which are outside the range of the normal values, for example something like minus one or minus 9,000, just because I want the algorithm to be able to isolate that this value is different than the rest. Another way is to replace them with something that makes sense. Something, some, some, something, sometimes null may mean that you know the person didn't give you information or you, you might as well be able to replace it with zero uh, because it makes sense in this context. Um, uh, sometimes you actually try to predict your missing values, so you can use a subset of your data with known values, and you can try to predict the values that you don't know for the rest of the data. Sometimes this, this is working well. Uh, sometimes you may need to consider to remove rows completely with null values. You know, it's just, it's just because either it doesn't make sense or it's, it's, uh, it, it may be you are unlikely to encounter this type of missed information during modeling. Again, you need to be cautious, uh, but uh, this is something I have considered and has worked well in the past because a lot of missing values might be outliers. Uh, another way which I haven't listed is actually try to replace null values with something that has to do with the target variable. For example, if you can see that null values is associated with very low percentage of something happening, let's say your target variable, someone default, you can actually replace your your target variable with the value that reflects this. You know, that's, you know, if, if generally higher values in this variable are correlated with higher tar average target, then you can replace it with a very low value if null values are correlated with low percentage of the target variable. Don't know if that makes sense. Generally, use the target variable to replace the, use information from your target variable to replace the null values sensibly. And I think these were all the, the questions. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned because I have over exceeded my time. I will have a look to your questions uh, you asked in the, um, you know, live during, during the session and I'll try to answer them and, and send back along with this document. Hopefully it can give you some more insights about uh, how to improve in this area based on my knowledge.
uh, and based stuff I've learned from others. So um, I, I would like to thank you for for uh, for your time. Hopefully it was uh, useful. Um, generally, as as a last suggestion is you know don't get intimidated by by cargo. Every every everyone you know started from uh, from nothing I guess at some point. Uh, I am no exception. Um, I was only able to become better because you know I followed some of these steps, but because uh, this is a great community that shares things. And you know, and you can learn uh, by sharing knowledge with others, and um, you know, just you know, keep keep haggling. You know, get your hands dirty. That's that's basically uh, all all for me. Uh, I would like to thank you and uh, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.